today we're celebrating the Lord's Supper at Discover the Word Missionary Baptist Church. But we're going to go back all the way to where it all began. We're going to go back to the Passover to the Hasidor. And I'm using a little book here, The Concise Family Cedar by Rabbi Alfred J. Kalach. And this is what he says about the Passover or the Hasidor, the table. Goes all the way back to Egypt, doesn't it? Israel was in Egypt for over 400 years in slavery. And Egypt uh, was a place of paganism. It was a place of hard work. It was a place of having nothing. And the tray, there are basically uh, six places all together on this tray for herbs. And the tray is an evolution of, and the hostador is an evolution of the Passover that's been passed down from many generations. Uh, the Jewish people did not even speak their language for hundreds of years, probably over a thousand years, but they still would go through the Hebrew pronunciation of what was happening here at the Hasidor or the Passover. The cedar tray, which is placed at the head of the table, usually has six circular indentations in which the following symbols, symbolic foods, are placed. Now, we're going to have a symbolic d dinner here, or supper, that is, uh, in our church. And the bread and the wine have symbolic meanings. Organomatos te sans plu. The artos, the bread, the matzah, and the wine, yin, or oinos, or ganamatos te sans plu, have a symbolic meaning. Much different than here. The evolution of this dinner began to lead them astray. There was a lamb, remember? And the lamb is replaced by basically an egg. And uh, mara, mara are bitter herbs, either the head of a horseradish or some grated white horseradish is placed in the mara compartment, the bitter compartment. Mara symbolizes the bitter lot of the enslaved uh, Israelites described in the Haggadah. An extra dish of horseradish with a sufficient amount for each participant to have a small helping during the cedar should be set aside. The carpos or the vegetables. At one point during the cedar, we dip a vegetable in salt water. This custom prevalent in ancient times is explained more carefully in the text. Celery, parsley, cucumber, radish, potato or potato are among the vegetables commonly used. Let me tell you something. The Jews had, did not have potatoes because potatoes came from America. And that wasn't taken back to Egypt or to Europe until after Columbus times. So we're changing what is there to what they're practicing today. These are the vegetables commonly used and place a small piece of any of these vegetables in the carpos compartment. The chereseth, the food mixture. There are many recipes for chereset, but the most popular consists of chopped apples, walnut, cinnamon, moistened with wine, and a mortar, and formed into paste. The chereset is symbolic of the mortar the children of Israel were compelled to make when they moved, when they worked for the Egyptian taskmakers. Place a small amount of the mixture in the chariset compartment and keep a larger uh, portion separate dish for use of the appropriate time during the sedo. The zeroa. And this was the bone, remember? This was uh, the, the leg of lamb or the bone of the lamb. 
The bone is symbolic of the mighty arm of God, and it is symbolic of the sang, sacred Lamb of God, isn't it? John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. As the Bible describes this, which influenced Pharaoh to release the children of Israel from bondage, in some households a meat bone is roasted, in others the neck of a chicken, or in some other fowl is roasted and used as symbol, symbol on the tray. The botza egg, a hard-boiled egg, is roasted and placed on the cedar tray. The egg is symbolic of the festival sacrifice brought in temple times, and this was the lamb, remember. The charaset, most common modern cedar trays have the sixth compartment. Actually has the same symbolism as the maror, the bitter, mentioned above. The vegetable placed in this compartment is usually lettuce, watercress, radish, or any variety of the of, that has a tendency to become bitter. Alongside the place setting of each compartment is a wine goblet. Should be placed with the drinking of four cups of wine. They drank four cups of wine during the cedar. Reminder of the four references to redemption that are mentioned in the book of Exodus. The four are, I will bring you out of Egypt. I will deliver you from bondage. I will redeem the, you with an outstretched arm, and I will take you to me for my people. The salt water is used to dip the carpos, the vegetable, and for dipping the hard-boiled eggs, which are consumed immediately before the full meal is served. And the cup of Elijah, which we're going to be taking today, is the cup of Elijah. If we did this exactly right, we'd have one cup. All the early churches did not have communion cups. They had one cup, and they would hold it to one, and they would come up in front of the church, and they'd have the Lord's Supper, and they would take, and they would break the bread, and they'd all have a piece of bread. They'd all come back by, and then they would drink out of the cup. Each member of the church, and then the pastor would drink. That's the way it was done, because that was Elijah's cup. That stood for Elijah's cup. Now, the Passover message has this thing in common, the tyranny of poverty, the tyranny of privation, the tyranny of wealth, the tyranny of war, the tyranny of power, the tyranny of despair, the tyranny of disease, the tyranny of time, the tyranny of ignorance and the tyranny of color. All of these things as they would take the fruit of the vine, or the oinos or ganamatos te son plu, they would say Baruch Ata Adonai Elohine Malek Ha'olam Bore Peri Hagafain. And that is, praise be Jehovah our God. Praise be Jehovah our God. They leave the word Jehovah out and they'll say Adonai. But that's Jesus. I want you to remember that. Baruch Ata Adonai. That is uh, Yiyah. Yiyah. They don't pronounce it. We don't know how to say it. We don't know how to say the word Jehovah. But this word here is Jehovah. Praise be Jehovah, the Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine, who created the fruit of the vine. The other blessing and that was at the table where Jesus actually had this last supper, this Passover supper, and then the Lord's Supper. He instituted the Lord's Supper from the Passover, did he? He took a, what we call a family tradition, and we turned it into a church tradition. It took it away from every family in Israel, and they needed to join a church.
Baruch ata Adonai Elohinu Malek HaAlam Bore Peri HaAdama. Praise be the Lord, Jehovah, our God. And Jehovah is the one they rejected. Remember, Jehovah is the one they rejected. The king of the universe, Jesus is the king of the universe. He is the king of the universe. In Revelation, the 19th chapter, it tells you that. Behold, the Lamb of God. And it says, on his vesture. On his vesture is king of kings and lord of lords. Adonai, Ha'adonaim, king of kings and lord of lords. Praise be the Lord, the God of the universe, the king of the universe, who created the fruit of the earth. The Baruch, Bare Peri Ha'adama. Now, all of these things Jesus took from the Passover meal and turned it into what we might call our manifest destiny. Our manifest destiny. And in Ephesians, the second chapter, I know that this is unusual uh, communion or Lord's Supper message. But we need to know where it came from and all about it. Now let's go to Ephesians, the second chapter, and Paul could have been, it can, could have been just absolutely uh, observing the Lord's Supper when he said this in all reality because it says exactly the same thing that they said at the Passover, the Hasador. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in them. You were dead down in Egypt. Egypt is a type of what? Sin and bondage. In which you formerly walked according to the course, the roadway of this world, this cosmos. And that's talking about the whole evil cosmos, the angels and all of it. We're, we're walking before we're saved according to the roadway, the pathway of the whole cosmos of a fallen angelic, demonic, and a fallen humanity. This world, according to the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived. There are many religions that keep you dominated under this fear and uh, bondage. We're in bondage. Can you think of another uh, religion more uh, that has their people more in bondage than the Catholic Church or Islam or the Jehovah Witness or Mormonism in all reality? They're in bondage. They're still in their sins, and, and yet they think they have a religion, but they're in bondage. Among them, we all too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. We all know what that is. Indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Those remaining out there is what it means. The remaining out there. But God being rich in mercy. That's grace. Unmerited favor. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead. In our trespasses made us alive. We were taken out of Egypt. We were rescued out of Egypt. Made us alive together with Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. And has raised us up with him and seated with him, us with him, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And today, as we take this Lord's Supper, Jesus is here. He is here. We are taking the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. Now, in the uh, Catholic Church, we have the transubstantiation. They, would, they will say their magic words, and they will change the wine into blood, uh, the real blood of Jesus, and they will change the bread into the body of Jesus, which is a heresy. 
And in the Lutheran church, they changed the, the wine and the bread. And they don't say he's really there, but his presence is here. And yes, his presence is here with us. Jesus said, where there are two or three gathered together in my authority, I will be with you. He's here with us today, whether we take the Lord's Supper or not, didn't he? He's here. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we are there right now. In order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Jesus is kind. He is our redeemer. He is our counselor. He is the one that defends us. It says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved. In the Greek it says, For in grace you are having been saved. Through faith, and that faith doesn't come out of you. It is a gift of God. So by faith we believe, and by faith we repent, and by faith we are saved. Not a result of works that we should boast about it, for we are his workmanship. Now I've seen you girls, both of you girls, I've seen your workmanship in art. And it's fantastic. It's absolutely beautiful. You can see in your minds and in your, in your abilities to, to fashion beautiful scenes. And you created these art, works of art. And I've seen both of your works of art. Sharon and Marilyn. And they're beautiful. We are works of God's art. We are his work. We are his statues. We are what we are by the grace of God. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works or unto good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in them Therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles. You were like Gentiles. We are Gentiles. I am part, I am really a son of Abraham, uh, literally, by blood. I have a little bit of Arabic blood in me. That's not the chosen side. They was Hagar and Sarah, wasn't they? Hagar was a the mother of those in slavery in all reality, those in bondage. Hagar was a princess of Egypt, remember? She was Pharaoh's daughter. And he gave Hagar to Abraham as a political marriage. And then he gave her to his wife as a slave, as a slave in bondage. And then she gave him to him to be his wife. And she conceived and had a child. And that was a child of slavery. Like we were once in this world. We were Gentiles in the flesh. Uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. Which is performed in flesh by human hand. And we, we have Jewish people today circumcising their children on the eighth day. And yet thumbing their noses at God because they hate the Messiah that all of this represents. Yes? Amen? Remember that you were at times separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants and promises and having no hope. We have no hope without Christ. And without God in this world, God was in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were formerly, were far off, have been brought near by what? By the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace. He himself is our hostador. He himself is our savior and our door into heaven and heavenly places who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of dividing wall by, by abolishing it in his flesh. We're talking about his blood now, and we're talking about his flesh, aren't we? 
and the, the wine represents, the fruit of the wine represents his blood and the bread, his body. Broke down the barrier by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the hatred, which is the law and the commandments contained in ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace between God and man. And the word peace is the word shalom, isn't it? What does the word peace mean? Agreement. agreement. The word peace means agreement. And the only, time, only way we can have peace with God is by what? Agreeing with him that we are sinners and that we need to be saved and that Jesus Christ did come into this world to save us. In verse number 16, that he might reconcile them in both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity, the hatred. And he came and preached peace unto you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you were no longer strangers and aliens, pilgrims. But we are pilgrims in this world, aren't we? But you are fellow citizens and the saints and God's home household. And we take the Lord's Supper as a church, don't we? We believe in close communion. I didn't say closed. I didn't say closed and I didn't say open communion. I said close communion because it, it is a communion of one body of believers remembering the Lord. Having built, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets in Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and he is the cornerstone of our little church, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. A holy temple, that means a habitable place for God. In whom also you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. First Corinthians 11 chapter now. Paul the Apostle has been um, condemning the practices and the actions of the church at Corinth for 11 chapters so far in this book. This was a long letter, and it was, it was the church had so many problems in it, and I'm thankful because we have those problems in churches today. He had to write two letters to this church. And now they have been practicing the Lord's Supper recklessly, let's put it that way, recklessly. Uh, what were they doing? Uh, Sharon, what were some of the things they were doing at the Lord's Supper? Getting drunk. Getting drunk. Getting drunk. And fighting. I remember so many years ago, I took over a church as a pastor that the pastor before me was really an unusual person. The, the church had never had the Lord's Supper. They never took the Lord's Supper. They did baptize a few people. I think there were nine, seven to nine members in that church when I, when I came there. And it had been about 40 years in the making. In three years, there were three, over 300 people in the church. But I asked him one time, I said, why don't we take the Lord's Supper? Oh, he said, we can't do that. We can't take the Lord's Supper. I said, why? I said, we're, we believe in baptism in the Lord's Supper. Why can't we take the Lord's Supper? I've never had the Lord's Supper. And I told him, I've never had the Lord's Supper. And he said, well, we're not going to take the Lord's Supper. And I said, why? Well, he said, there are families in the church that have real problems between the families. And, uh, and there are people that have a lot of sin in their lives and there are people that have a lot of hate in their lives and they have a lot of enmity between one another. And so therefore, if we took the Lord's Supper, half of the church would be killed. So that would leave three. 
Well, I didn't say anything else because he's pastor of church. I just let him go on believing and practicing what he did. <clears throat> and when I became pastor of the church, one of the first things that we did, we took the Lord's Supper because the church hadn't taken the Lord's Supper in 30-something years. It was totally foreign to them. It was uh, used as a, uh, as a fear factor. They didn't take the Lord's Supper because they weren't going to repent. They weren't going to, they weren't going to get their acts together. They weren't going to love one another. They weren't going to do all of this. And I preached a sermon a few weeks before we did have the Lord's Supper, a nail in your brother's coffin. And I took some great big 16, 18, 20 penny nails and big nails, the biggest ones I could find, and I put them down in a bowl, a, a bucket in front of the altar. And I talked about to them about fighting among themselves. And I said, now, you have done great damage in your mind and your hearts to one another. I want you to come down here, and I want you to take that nail, and I want you to give it to the person that you tried to drive a nail in their coffin. And I got a lot of them nails. And people, they cried, and they asked each other to forgive each other. A church was raised on hate. Raised on hate. We took the Lord's Supper. We remembered the Lord. That church needed that sermon, whether we took the Lord's Supper or not. When I left that church, that hate began again, and they just, they just destroyed each other, and the church just disbanded. The terrible story. Because of hate and, and orneriness and hard-headedness and, and opinionated. We have a nation that's divided today because of opinions. The Democrats today do not want to hear the, pen, the, the uh, uh, opinions of the conservatives at all. They want to shut them down, and that's basically called communism. That happened in China. It happened in Russia, Czechoslovakia, all those satellite nations of Russia. And we as churches ought to be able to exist with differences of opinion in our lives. And as a nation, we should be able to also. We should be able to vote our views. We ought to be, society owes that to its constituents, if it's a democracy. Every little church is a democracy, isn't it? We vote on everything. We voted on accepting members and voted on baptizing. We we vote on uh, taking the Lord's Supper. We could even vote on what color to paint the church house if we wanted to, if we had one. <laughs> we could do that, couldn't we? Now let's go here to the Lord's Supper itself as it's instituted in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he broke it. Now he didn't say, we go back, the bread. Remember what they said at the bread. All right. What verse is it here? Oh, this, this is 1 Corinthians 11 chapter. But now I'm going back into the hasador, the cedar, okay? I read verse number 11, 23, and 24. Baruch Ata Adonai. Now, the word Adonai, we can put the word Jehovah. Or yeah, okay. 
Elohinu Malekha Alam Bare Peri Ha Adama. Praise be the Lord God, the King of the universe. That's talking about Jesus there. They missed the boat. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus, the King of the universe who created the fruit of the earth. Now let's have a prayer. Our Father, I, as I break this bread, as the pastor and leader of this church, help us to remember what it stands for. Help us go beyond all our differences and all of our loves and hates and things and, and, and just remember you because you gave your life for us. You, your body you gave for us. This bread represents your body that was on the cross of Calvary. Please forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, in Jehovah's name I pray, amen. This bread is, uh, is one loaf. Now the Jews don't know why they did this. This is actually a kosher bread. This is unleavened bread. It's only water and flour, that's all. And all along, every cracker that you have out there has piercings in it, holes in the cracker. That piercings represent the Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's what it represents. The piercings represent that. So we break this bread, which represents his body. And we pass it out. Remembering that it is not the body of me, Jesus Christ. It is not a vehicle of grace. But only we do it in a symbolic remembrance of him. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohinu Malek Olam Bore Peri Hagafen. That is the fruit of the vine. And we'll take that in a moment. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohinu Malek Olam Bore Peri Hagafen. Praise be the Lord God, the King of the universe, Jehovah, the King of the universe, who created the fruit of the earth. And Father, as we take this bread, we're remembering our Savior and our God, and our Jehovah. He was the one that became for us to redeem us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And he broke and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember it to me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, after the hostador. He's going to change the hostador from a family institution to a church remembrance, a church memorial. The church is founded upon Jesus Christ, our Savior. He took the cup, and after the supper, saying, Now this cup is what cup? Elijah's, Elijah's cup. cup. Now we are kind of messing this up a little bit by using communion mm -hmm. cups, but I want you to remember it's one cup, because it represents our one Savior. The loaf of bread represented one body and one Savior. And the cup represents... One church, one body, and one Savior in his blood. This cup is the new covenant, the new barith, the new hekaine diatheke, the new covenant. In my blood, do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me, 
For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever drinks the cup of the Lord and eats the bread in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In many churches, when they take the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is not a vehicle of grace. There's nothing going to you to this day in you when you ate that bread. It's not making you more holy. It is not making you, it is not a vehicle of grace that gets you into heaven. It's not one of the keys to the doors of heaven. It's simply that we remember our Savior, who he is. Baruch atah Adonai Elohinu Malech HaAlam Borei Peri HaGafein Praise be the Lord God, Jehovah our God, the King of the universe who created the fruit of the vine. Again, I'm to say something. Our Father, we, as we take this fruit of the vine, we know we're not worthy. But Father, we pray that you glorify your son this moment and that we glorify him in remembering what he's done for us in Jesus name our Savior Amen remembering our Savior and this as his blood Our Father, our Savior, our Lord, our God. Father, thank you for allowing us to remember you like this. For allowing us to be partakers in the household of God. We may not be great here in number, but Father, your word goes out to all the world this day and forever. And Father, use it to touch people's lives and let them know what your memorial dinner is, what your memorial supper, and what it is not. Father, thank you for our Savior that gave his life for us in the bread and in the wine. In Jesus' name.